439, the pianist is playing Work for the Night is Coming, 439. Work for the night is coming, work through the morning hours. Work while the dew is sparkling, work mid-springing flowers. Work when the day grows brighter, work in the glowing sun. Sing page number 375. <clears throat> 375, which is I gave my life for thee. <clears throat> Sing out all four verses. I gave my life for thee, be my precious blood I shed, that thou might ransom me, be and quicken from the Please remain standing. Let's go ahead and pray. Would you bow with me? 
Gracious Father in heaven, we're mindful that you gave your son for us. And I can't sing that song, Lord, without thinking of Paul's words that it's my reasonable service to present my body a living sacrifice to you, holy and acceptable. And that is reasonable, Lord. You're not asking too much for that. And Lord, as we look at what you bore for us, what you continue to carry for us on a daily basis, you're the one that stood and invited us to come if we labor and are heavy laden that we could find rest in you. Lord, I ask that you would give us that rest for our souls. We want to pause before you, Lord, and thank you for life. You are the author, the giver of life. And Lord, I pray that you would bring our nation to repentance. I know, Lord, that that's a difficult thing to ask because I don't know all that it entails for that to happen. But Lord, I do pray for that. I pray that you would help us to be a nation that honors life, that cherishes life nationally. Lord, many of your people around this country do, and others who don't even name your name, they respect life. We acknowledge, Lord, that each one of us, as human beings even, down to our very core, our very makeup, we were all created in your image. But in that, Lord, we, we fell when Adam fell, we all fell. And when Adam bore children, he did so after his own likeness. That grieves me, Lord, because it was in a state of sin that I was born, as David said, in sin my mother did conceive me. We understand we're fearfully and wonderfully made, but Lord, without you, we cannot be born again. We must be born again, born from above, not just born physically, but born spiritually. Lord, I thank you not only for physical life, but for spiritual life that comes from your good hand by your grace through faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask your blessing on this service, Lord. We dedicate it to you. We pray and ask that you'd be pleased by what you see and hear tonight as we sing these songs. We admonish one another in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. We sing with melody in our hearts, and Lord, it's to no one else but to you. We worship you, we adore you, and Father, I pray that your word would be that which we need tonight, accomplish your work in our lives, bless our singing and the preaching, and all that goes on around here, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. That's what we do, right? We occupy till Jesus comes. It takes a risen Savior to save the lost. It takes a living Savior to comfort broken hearts. It takes a living Savior to prepare heaven for us when we die. Good words from the late Dr. Clyde Box. And uh, we have some things coming up I'd like to just remind you of, a couple of things in your bulletin. Saturday, January 30th, you'll want to keep on your calendar for the men that are with us, our Master's Men Meeting. And we'll begin uh, this month by having monthly meetings to start with. And throughout the quarter, one of those will be breakfast. And so we're planning to have breakfast in March uh, leading up to Easter time. So this one, uh, this one, we're just going to meet at 9. We're going to pray before everybody goes out for outreach. And that'll be a blessing. January 31st is uh, Bible Sunday. And if you have an old Bible, we'd like to display that if you wouldn't mind. So see me, see Pastor Ward, and uh, let's get that put out for that Sunday. And uh, let's just remember that what we hold in our hands when we hold the Bible, many people have given their life's blood for us to be able to hold the Word of God. It's gone through things. I was reading just last week about uh, Christians, uh, Voice of Martyrs, if you're familiar with them. They've been sending Bibles over into North Korea from South Korea for I don't know how long now. And, well, the heat's coming down on them. And they're, gonna, they're, they're talking about being in trouble it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when they'll be in trouble for doing that from South Korea. And what I was reading is they were wondering if they were going to make that retroactive on all the Bibles they've already sent, if that was going to be part of their sentence. What a sad day when the Word of God is being, is being uh, persecuted like that. And we need to remember it's our job to give that out. And, uh, and so as we think about Bible Sunday, it's important because the Word of God is where we find words of life, precious words of life. So keep that on your radar. 
So that's really all that I have. I'd like to take just a moment to congratulate our young people. They made it up to the youth rally on Friday night. Our trailmen were able to tag along as part of the troop. We adjusted our activities for the camp out because of their adjustment on the, on the preaching calendar. And so uh, I'm pleased to be able to let you know that our young people here at First Baptist of Westminster, they studied, they earned it, they worked for it, and they came home with first place on the Bible quiz. I mean, there wasn't even any competition. It was, they, they, they just smoked them all, left them in the dust. It was like 55 points to, I think the other highest I heard was 15 on a couple of other churches. So uh, the hard work paid off. And I want to say thank you, especially to Madeline. She carried most of that. And so she studied very, very hard. In fact, they, she studied so hard that I, I heard the preacher even even stopped and said, is she reading from something? Because <laughs> she, she just had it. She just had it down. And so uh, our trailmen really enjoyed that night. And I want to tell you, the Word of God, the seed was planted in the hearts of some young men that night that went up and heard the preaching from our group. And so just be in prayer for these young men as they continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Pray that uh, young people would be saved. I don't know, but I heard that there were some decisions. There were hands that were being raised around the room for salvation after the preaching that night. And so do pray. But it was just a tremendous time Friday. Our trailmen did well uh, on the field when we uh, completed our camp out. We run them through the rigors. You know, they did uh, activities yesterday. They did a search and rescue scenario where they had to rescue in place. And so they exercised some rope skills and first aid skills and primitive shelter building skills and I'm tired skills and I'm cold skills and I'm just it was a great time though God gave us beautiful weather thank you for praying because it could have been a lot a lot more difficult to be out there especially this time of year in January in Colorado I mean who's crazy enough to go camping in January in Colorado in a tent you know we're the only tents in the place but our boys did wonderful thank you for praying I'm excited to see the growth that's happening and so I want to just uh just take this time here to welcome each one of you tonight. Say thank you for being faithful to the house of God here on Sunday evening. We also have those that are joining in on Zoom uh, with our virtual connection, probably some listening on Uber Conference. I want to say hi to you and let you know we love you and we're praying for you. We're glad you're able to join our service. So we're going to continue worshiping before we get into the message tonight now. We're going to sing another song, 368, Have I Done My Best for Jesus. 368 and brother tim sinks he helps lead our music around here and he's going to come and lead us in this song brother tim before we sing uh i i forget to say uh anything to pastor walker uh, before the church service but i do want to draw your attention to our missions board that's out in the vestibule and just for a week or two we're uh placing some uh, pictures up on that board from Peter in China, and uh, uh, I hope you'll look those over. It's just kind of a summary of things that have gone on, and he sent us a whole bunch of pictures with some information on them, so maybe you can stop and um, uh, peruse what information he has there and continue to pray for uh, not all, uh, both of our missionaries that are in China. So just want to draw your attention to that. Amen. <clears throat> I wonder, have I done my best for... I'm sorry, let's... Uh, can we start again? <laughs> let's try 368. Do you know where you're at? I'm not sure I do. <laughs> okay, here we go. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus Who died upon the cruel tree of his great sacrifice at Calvary. I know my Lord expects the best from me. How many are the hopes that I have lived on? How many are the chain I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? When he has done so much for me. Now the last verse. No longer will I stay within the valley. I'll climb to mountain heights above. The world is dying now for want of someone to 
tell them of the Savior's matchless love. How many are the lost that I have lifted? How many are the chained I've helped to free? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus when he has done so much for me? Amen. That's a truth in song that will prepare us for where we'll spend our time in God's Word tonight. I want you to turn to two places as we begin. First, go to Matthew chapter 12, but put a finger in Jonah chapter 1. Matthew chapter 12, we'll read some verses there. Then we'll spend the rest of our time, Lord willing, in the book of Jonah. I'll give you just a moment to find both places. Matthew chapter 12. I draw your attention towards the end in verse 38. We read the words of our Savior in these. In verse 38 through 42... Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it, because they, repent, they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Lord, I ask that You would help us to understand Your Word clearly. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary as we look at this prophet of the Old Testament. May we not lose sight of the old rugged cross. This was the sign that you gave to that generation. When you died on Calvary, that was the only sign that they would see. When you laid in that earth and that grave for three days and three nights, that was the only sign that they would be given. But when you gloriously rose from the dead that third day, it was confirmed that your sacrifice was accepted for us. Lord, bless your word and help us to be preachers of it. Each one of us, Lord, in the sense that we're given the commission to do, to go and preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, may we fulfill this in the days ahead in this ministry, in this church, and may Your blessing reside upon it. We rejoice, Lord, and thank You for all that You've done in recent days to stir us afresh and anew to see that You're still working and to see that Your Word is still powerful and touching people's lives. Help us to hold it forth firmly, faithfully, as the pillar and ground of the truth. And may the message of Your Word be that which stirs us on in reasonable service, mindful of what You've done for us. And may we, at the close of our time here in this life, be able to say we've done our best for You. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus did with compassion what Jonah did with complaint. What is the difference between Nineveh and Washington, D.C.? Oh, there he goes. He's already getting political in his message. I just have to throw that out. I want you to think about it. What is the difference between Nineveh and Washington, D.C.? May I submit to you that everything is different, and at the same time, nothing is different. I can say everything is different when I read the book of Jonah. I can say uh, nothing is different when I read the book of Nahum. If you know your Bible, you understand where that comes from. I, my intent tonight 
in our endeavor in the Word of God is to read through all 48 verses here. Uh, it's four chapters. I think this is one of those books that is conducive to doing this in a message. So stay focused on the text, and I know the Word of God will accomplish that to which God sends it. As we look at the book of Jonah, it, it is a mere 48 verses, but the book of Jonah, can I say, it just touches on so many numerous themes throughout the book, themes uh, that we would say are theological themes in some areas. We encounter in the book of Jonah God's sovereignty. We see His mercy. We see His compassion. We see God's concern for the Gentiles. This book is also about a disobedient Israelite prophet, and it is about the repentance of the wicked. We're going to look at these as we look at the book of Jonah tonight. But can I say to you as we begin that I believe and am firmly convinced when we encounter the God of the book of Jonah, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, the God of you and I today, if you name the name of Christ, the same God is a God who is merciful even to them who have failed to extend that same mercy to others. And He forgives those who humble themselves under His Word. Let me say that one more time. God is merciful even to them that have failed to extend that same mercy to another. And He forgives those who humble themselves under His Word. God would much rather, friend tonight, forgive your repentance when you change your mind about how you stand before Him, He would much rather forgive your repentance and your godly sorrow over sin than He would punish you for remaining yet stubborn in your sins. I think about Jesus in John chapter 8 when He looked a group of religious leaders square in the face and told them that He was going somewhere they couldn't go and they would die in their sins because they believed not that He was the Son of God. These are the same people, mind you, that asked Him for that sign. And He said, there'll be no sign given to this generation but one. And we read it. It's the sign of the prophet Jonah. God prefers to forgive your repentance over punishing you for remaining stubborn in your sins. We need to arise and take God's message of salvation to a lost and dying world. Excuse me. I've been out in the cold too long, can you tell? That's our task today. If you want to see a prophet that was commissioned to go and take the Word of God to a people that needed it, Jonah is the man. And we can apply it. We can learn many things from the prophet Jonah. As we look at this book tonight, I want you to set your eyes on the text in Jonah with me. Having that verse we read in Matthew in the back of our mind, remembering the sign that was given to the generation that Jesus spoke to. What was that sign? Well, let's go read it because these four chapters encompass that sign. Jonah received the first chance he got from the Lord, and we see that in chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to chapter 2, verse 10. In these first two chapters, the book breaks down nicely into four chapters, by the way, uh, but... I'm going to break it down into two major parts. We're going to look at the first half and then the second half. Jonah's first chance, Jonah went down. Now, I have a friend in the ministry. He's a dear friend, a dear brother in Christ. And maybe you've heard of uh, Timberline Baptist Church down in Manitou Springs, Pastor Dan Parton. Uh, We've known them for many years, and he came and took that church, and, and they're blessed there at the foot of Pikes Peak right in Manitou, and they're preaching faithfully the Word of God every week. He has a message. He sends out his sermon outlines every week. And so if you ever wonder where I get some of my material, I steal it from him. I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't do too much of that. I do reference it though. And so I noticed he had a message one time that was simply titled, Jonah Went Down. And I, I like that message because it does show us what Jonah did, doesn't it? And so thank you, Pastor Parton, for pointing that out to us, that when Jonah went down, he went down. And he went down to Joppa. He went away from the Lord. He went away from the direction that God had called him to do. And so let's notice, first off tonight, Jonah's flight in verses 1 through 7. Read it with me, if you would, in your Bible. You have the copy of Scriptures right there in your hands. Let's read it together in the Word of God. Jonah chapter 1, verse number 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying... 
Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. We hear some overtones there, do we not, of Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember the angels that came and fellowshiped with uh, Abraham and the, the one that was, uh, that was the angel of the Lord that fellowshiped with him and could not withhold what they were doing from Abraham because of their fellowship and their closeness and revealed to Abraham the mind of God that these had come to be a witness against Sodom and Gomorrah because they had to verify and, and be witnesses against the city that the wickedness came up before God. You see, Nineveh was a very, very wicked city. Can I tell you, we have sprinkled across our nation very, very wicked cities. And if we're not careful, we, uh, we will face judgment one day for it. In fact, I believe judgment is on the horizon. Jonah's flight, we read it, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. That's interesting to me. If God's omnipresent, <laughs> where are you going to go, Jonah? David said, if I go down to the depths, he's there. If I ascend to the heights, he's there. Where are you going to go, Jonah? Where can you really escape from the presence of Jehovah? Well, that means he's getting as far away from Jerusalem as he can, that's for sure. And he's not going to head up north towards, uh, towards Nineveh. He's going to take a boat there on the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, and he's going to head the polar opposite direction. Polar, I say that, it's east and west, and they don't have poles. That's funny, isn't it? He's going to go west when God called him to go northeast. And notice when he went down, he found a ship. You know, the Lord will let you find some things when you're looking for it. And he's looking for a ship. He found one that was going the way he wanted to go, but it was not God's way. Notice he paid the fare thereof. He rose up to flee unto Tarshish, that's over in, in Spain in that area, from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare thereof. When you go down and you go away from the Lord, mark it down and you're going to pay. And he paid the fare out of his own pocket for that, and then he's going to pay spiritually too, isn't he? From the presence of the Lord, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. God does that sometimes. He can use natural circumstances in a supernatural way. He's the creator of heaven and earth. There was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Not a place you want to be on the Mediterranean in a storm like that. I've never been there, but I don't ever, ever think I'd want to be there. Then the mariners were afraid. When you get mariners that are afraid, that's pretty bad. And cried every man unto his little G-God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. Is that drawing any imagery in your mind to another place in the Gospels by chance? No sign given unto this generation, but the sign of Jonas. And in, in fact, when I translated the book, I found that this was a sleep that Jonah was not going to wake up out of without help. He was fast asleep and I mean, I sleep through some pretty rough stuff, but sleeping through something like this, he's, he's crashed. He is knocked out, and he is out of commission in the bottom of this boat. Jesus also slept in the midst of a storm, didn't he? I think the circumstances are, are different, though, because he's the Savior, and Jonah here is fast asleep in this ship in the middle of the storm, so the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy big G God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. Hey, Jonah, did you realize that you were going to endanger others by your disobedience? Our sin doesn't just affect ourselves. When Jonah went down, he was about to take others with him. Keep that in mind. And they said, every one to his fellow, come and let us cast lots. That's how they did it in that day. That we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and guess what? Well, you're not getting away this time, Jonah. The lot fell upon Jonah. Chapter 2, we see Jonah prays for deliverance. Jonah went down. He went away from what God had called him to do. And he got in trouble for it. Can I tell you that there will be a reckoning one day? And if we aren't careful to obey the great commission of our Savior, we will give an account. 
Now, Jonah had God's deliverance upon him. We're going to see that. He was not forsaken. God did not forsake him and leave him to his own ends. God did a miraculous thing for Jonah. And He'll do miraculous things for us, but it matters that we trust and obey. Look at chapter 2 and notice with me the poetry that's here in Jonah's prayer for deliverance. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God, that's Jehovah, his Elohim, out of the fish's belly and said, now watch his words, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and He heard me. Isn't that a great truth? When you cry to the Lord, He hears. His ears are attentive unto the cry of those that acknowledge Him. Out of the belly of hell cried I. Any words of our Savior coming to mind with that phrase? And thou heardest my voice. What a picture of our Savior. For thou hast cast me Deep into the, uh, cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas. The floods compassed me about, and thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Any hymns coming to mind? Songwriters of days gone by write, The billows o'er me roll. Wonder where they got that idea from. Thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. Yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. You tried to get away from the presence of the Lord, Jonah, but God didn't let you go. I said, I'm cast out of thy sight. I'm going to look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul. The depth closed round about me. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me forever. I've never been held under the water this long. But what little I've experienced with water in this way, this is terrifying. It is terrifying. We weren't created with gills. We don't breathe underwater without help and without special apparatus. Jonah is in a place where his very life is at stake. It is a life or death situation. Now, I can't be dogmatic about this, but I'll give you my humble opinion. And, and again, this is my opinion. You understand this, right? I read these words, and I read his prayer, and how vivid it is. And I have no question in my mind, I believe Jonah died. You may disagree with me. You're free to do with that. You can be wrong, but I believe Jonah died. Because it's a picture of the resurrection power of our God. He met His doom. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet, oh, thank God for that word, yet. Listen to this prayer. Thou hast brought up my life from corruption. O oh Lord, my God. Has God done that for your soul? Has He brought you out of the miry clay and set your feet upon a rock and established your going. Come, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt His name together, the psalmist said. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds Thy hands have made. I look at Jonah and I see God delivered him. Yet Thou brought up my life from corruption. From what? From corruption. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Never give up on anybody. Not even in the last moments, never give up on them. God never gave up on Jonah. He was as close as close could be right here. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. That's a phrase I had to pause over. They that... Observe lying vanities. Remember those fellows, those mariners that cast lots for Jonah? And the lot fell on Jonah? Empty vanities. The gods they were serving, and yet they're crying for mercy and they've forsaken their own mercy. They were given mercy the moment they threw Jonah over the side of the ship. The storm halted and it was peaceful and they lived, and yet the same mercy they couldn't extend to another. What a picture. 
And then a picture of Jonah, is it not? The same mercy that he was given from God, he's going to go and extend that. He's going to do it with complaining because of who those people are that he's supposed to go preach to. My prayer came in unto thee, in thine holy, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. You want to know a person who's thankful to, for life? Thankful for another day? You talk to somebody that's come this close to having their life vaporized in a sense, taken from the physical life, and I'll show you somebody who's thankful to be alive. Thankful. And I'm thankful that God saved me. I'm thankful for my Savior and His grace and His goodness. With the voice of thanksgiving, Jonah says, I will pay that I have vowed salvation is of the Lord. It is of the Lord. So Jonah went down, but Jonah didn't stay down because Jonah came to himself. He had a moment where he realized, I did the wrong thing here. My disobedience has brought calamity on others. And he prayed to the Lord and the Lord heard him. And he was saved. He was delivered. There are different definitions of salvation. This one was his life was brought back to him. He was spared. He was resurrected, I believe, actually, in that fish. I will pay that that I have vowed salvation of the Lord. So notice Jonah's resurrection in verse number 10. The Lord spake unto the fish. Now, isn't that funny? Here's Jehovah. Hey, fish, do your thing. I don't know. That's just my glorified imagination. What did he say to the fish? I don't know. He spake unto it. And that fish, without batting a fin, <laughs> I'll let you read the rest of the verse. Hopefully you haven't had dinner yet. The fish did. And dinner upset his stomach. He spake unto the fish, and the fish did what it did. But notice where it put Jonah. Hmm. I don't know exactly where that was, but he was able to figure out where it was and figure out where Nineveh was from where he was and make a beeline to where God told him to go the first time. So notice with me, not only Jonah's first chance, he should have just done it right the first time, right? Oh, would to God I could go back and redo some things that I severely messed up for God, but I'm thankful, so thankful, that he's a God of second chances. Notice Jonah's second chance. <clears throat> Before we look at that, I want to tell you a story here. Jonah 1, 17 says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I heard uh, Pastor Tate Thronson preach a message at a preacher's meeting one time. I think it was a High Plains meeting, Pastor Ward, and he preached on this little fish. He had a whole message on this fish. And one thing that was, uh, that was neat to me that he pointed out was how God had this little minnow swimming around the Mediterranean that he protected and watched over and nothing ever got this little minnow until this little minnow became big enough to be the food chain. And then God's providence just that this fish out of all of the... I mean, from the Mediterranean, you can get anywhere, right? I mean, it's connected all the waterways. Out of all the places that this fish could be, it was in that sea at that time where that boat was with these mariners, with that Jonah who was asleep at that very time. And this was a fish that was like no other fish in the Mediterranean. This fish had God's purpose on it. And this was the fish that God spoke to. God has a way of working in our lives. The Lord had prepared that fish. Many people find it difficult to take the book of Jonah seriously because they find it hard to believe that a man could be swallowed by a whale and live to tell the story. Well, let's think about that. The following account of a modern-day man who underwent a similar experience and did live to tell his story may be of help. The following account is taken from the Princeton Theological Review, volume 25 in 1927, page 636. In February 1891, let's put our time cap on. Let's go back. February 1891. The whaling ship Star of the East was in the vicinity of the Falkland Islands, and the lookout sighted a, a large whale three miles away. It was a sperm whale. And the two boats were launched, and in a short time, one of the harpooners was enabled to spear the fish. 
The second boat attacked the whale, but was upset by a lash of its tail, and the men were thrown into the sea, one man being drowned, and another, James Bartley, having disappeared, could not be found. The whale was killed in a few hours and was laying by the ship's side, and the crew were busy with axes and spades removing the blubber, and they worked all day and part of the night, and the next morning they attached some tackle to the stomach which was hoisted onto the deck. The sailors were startled by something in it which gave a spasmodic sign of life, and inside was found the missing sailor, doubled up and unconscious. He was laid on the deck and treated to a bath of seawater, which soon revived him. He remained two weeks a, ra a ravaging lunatic, and at the end of the third week, he had entirely recovered from the shock and resumed his duties. Bartley affirms that he would probably have lived inside his house of flesh until he starved, for he lost his senses through fright and not from lack of air. He remembers the sensation of being thrown out of the boat into the sea. He was then encompassed by great darkness, and he felt he was slipping along a smooth passage of some sort that seemed to move and carry him forward. The sensation lasted but a short time, and then he realized he had more room. He felt about him, and his hands came in contact with a yielding, slimy substance that seemed to shrink from his touch. It finally dawned upon him that he had been swallowed by the well. He could easily breathe, but the heat was terrible. It was not a scorching, stifling nature, but it seemed to open the pores of his skin and draw out his vitality. His skin was exposed to the action of the gastric juice, his face, neck, hands, they were bleached to a deadly whiteness took on the appearance of parchment, never really recovered its natural appearance. I wonder what old Jonah looked like. I think if I saw him walking into Nineveh, I'd be like, we need to get saved right now. His health didn't seem to be affected by the terrible appearance, though. Can I tell you it's important that when God gives us a message to deliver, that we deliver that message. Now I'm not saying He's going to prepare a fish that's going to come eat you if you don't, but that's what He did to Jonah. There may be other consequences that I know not. I'm not God, but I am told in the Scriptures that every one of us shall stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what we've done. We sung some songs tonight that remind us we need to work for the night's coming. We need to make sure we've done our best for Jesus. This is not some psychological manipulation that I'm trying to twist your arm or make you feel guilty when you leave here tonight. I don't want you feeling like, oh, well, I need to do more. And I, I don't want you to do it out of duty. I want you to remember that the sign was given to that generation. And what your Savior did for you on Calvary ought to compel you to say, Lord, you died for me. The least I can do, my reasonable services, I can live for you. And Jonah, he should have done it right the first time, but he failed to deliver an important message. There's some in our audience, in our congregation, that will appreciate this next thing I'm going to share with you. During a surprise audit, the uh, U.S. Postal Service discovered that some local managers had temporarily stashed unprocessed mail in parked trailers so that supervisors wouldn't notice it was delayed. Post office would never do that, would they? Auditors found millions of pieces of undelivered mail, including 2.3 million bulk business letters, some of which were delayed nine days, and 800,000 first-class letters, which had been held for three days. What do you think the supervisors did? I don't know. They probably called the union anyway, didn't they? That's probably what Pastor Larson would say. Um, that's amazing. I've lost packages in the mail. I've had packages that people had sent to me that never arrived. Jonah had a message. He, in essence, had a letter from God that would be a matter of life and death for this city. And with that precious package from the Lord, he said, I know you want me to go this way, Lord. I'm not doing it. When Peter stood before the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 16. Jesus asked him, Whom say men that I am? And 
Some of them had different people that they referenced. They thought Jesus was Jeremiah. They thought he was this. They thought he was Elijah. They thought he was this prophet or that prophet. Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Peter, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And he told Peter, upon your profession, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But right after that, He affirmed to Peter, and I've given unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand that as a disciple, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been given a precious message of life and hope. And while you're walking this way, never forget, you have the keys that can open the door of heaven for someone who needs to hear. Somebody needs to hear your testimony about what Jesus Christ has done for you. What should be the penalty when people entrusted with delivering something fail to do that work? The world may not be expecting the delivery, but they are awaiting the message of the good news concerning God sending His Son to be our Savior. And we must, we must be faithful to deliver this message. When God calls you to go east and you go west, it's clearly against His divine will. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's long-suffering to usward. He's not like us. He's long-suffering. God is merciful even to them who have failed to extend that same mercy to others. And He forgives those who humble themselves under His Word. And I'm thankful we see, as I mentioned a moment ago, Jonah's second chance. Jonah got another chance. This is chapter 3 and 4. Jonah preaches to lost Nineveh. Look at it with me in chapter 3. Verse number 1, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time. I love that. I love that word. The second time. Again, God didn't give up on Jonah, and He's not going to give up on you. You might not have done maybe uh, what you feel like you needed to do before, but God's given you another chance. You have today, you have tomorrow if He tarries your coming, and you live to see it. He's given you another breath to serve Him. Tomorrow is another day that you can go be a witness for Jesus Christ. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Notice it's not Jonah's message. It's the preaching that God had bidden him. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said... Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Wow. So the people of Nineveh believed God. Isn't that amazing? Here's a man that walked through the streets of a city and cried, Forty days. Judgment's coming. Forty days. I wonder what would happen if we were to walk through the streets of Washington, D.C. or New York City or Los Angeles or whatever other city you want to name and say, Jesus is coming again. Hell is moving. Death is looming. Judgment awaits. God's wrath is sure. I wonder if we were to go cry that in the streets of Westminster, if we wouldn't be shackled, locked up, put in a straight jacket and put in a padded room somewhere because they'd think we've done lost it. I've lost nothing. I've gained everything with Jesus. The Bible is still clear. I read the back of the book, and yes, we win, but before we win, this world's going through tribulation like it's never seen. We think 2020 has been bad. Can I just uh, say it like we'd say it in Georgia? You ain't seen nothing yet. I wish I didn't have to say that. I wish it were different. But I'm telling you, we're running out of time. Nineveh only had so long. And depending on how they responded to Jonah's message, it would determine whether they had a space of grace a little longer or not. 
Now, God never changed His mind. Judgment still came to Nineveh. Mark it down. But it's going to be 150 years at least before Nahum's going to come. And as we look at this, we need to understand we have a job to do to let people know judgment is coming. He arose. He went to Nineveh. He did it like God said it. He began to enter the city, and he cried, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. Can I tell you that there's two Washington, D.C.'s really happening right now? I know there are some godly people that are in the halls of government somewhere that maybe they haven't done it physically, but after the events we've gone through in these recent weeks, I guarantee you in their soul they feel like this. They've gone out and they're weeping. Perhaps others are... I mean, people are dealing with a lot of emotions right now over what's going on, and rightly so, because this is our nation. This is our God-given nation. And if we don't do something, then we will face God's judgment. We need Him. And oh, to God, we would have leaders that would do what this king did and proclaim a fast and do whatever's necessary to get people's attention to say we can't keep going this direction. We're headed to a path that leads to the erosion and the demise of our freedoms and our liberties. I don't know exactly what the judgment will look like, but I sure don't want to be here when it comes. I might be, but God will give me grace in that day, won't He? So the people of Nineveh believed God, even if we could just start there, right? And then proclaim a fast. Do you, uh, do you listen when our government leaders say we need to pray? Today is a day that many of our government leaders have said we need to pray for the sanctity of life. It marks the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. That's why we celebrate the sanctity of life today. And we remember that God is the author of life. But are we fasting? Are we praying? Are we really sorry over what we've done as a nation? I know maybe you haven't, but as a nation, collectively, we're guilty before God, just like Nineveh was. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose, verse 6, from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. As the leader goes, so go the people. He was willing to do it, and they followed him in it. And they got right with God. He caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way. You want to know what repentance will look like? What revival will look like in America? It's when we turn from our evil ways. We've not yet done that wholeheartedly to our God. I wish it were different. And from the violence that is in their hands, God will take up the cause of those who cannot defend themselves against the wickedness of humanity. He will be the one to fight for them. If it means judgment, it means judgment. But He will stand up for those who can't stand up for themselves. The violence that is in their hands. And this is what the king understood. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from His fierce anger that we perish not? I don't know. I don't know if we have any hope in this or not, but it's worth a shot, isn't it? It's worth trying. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that He had said that He would do unto them, and He did it not. I have a quote I want you to read here. It's a slide that they can go ahead and put up from uh, the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I thought this was fitting. God's mercies are always unmerited. His grace is never earned. Repentance is never a work to be rewarded. You see, they're not getting a reward because they got right with God. They're getting spared from judgment and from wrath. This is not their ticket into heaven. This is God's staying of judgment on their nation, contextually. Understand that. It matters 
how nations respond to a thrice holy God. Our nation needs to get right with God. Who can tell if God will turn and repent? You see, Nineveh's repentance delayed God's destruction. So this is not to say that God does not act in response to such repentance. Clearly He does. He did so on the behalf of Nineveh. And it delayed their destruction for about 150 years. The people evidently fell into sin again. And so that later the city was destroyed in 612 B.C. And Nahum, the prophet, will prophesy against Nineveh, and Nineveh will fall. Nahum is a, another prophet in the Minor Prophets. And notice that when God does what He told Jonah He would do, Jonah went, he arose, and he followed through, he obeyed, right? He's not going back to the fish thing. No, we're not doing that again. Said, I'll, I'll go. But boy, he was complaining the whole way. Jesus did with compassion what Jonah did with complaint. Jonah's complaint in God's faithfulness, I know he's faithful, but I'm going to complain about it. Why do you got to save them? I, I, I wrestle with this sometimes. I've got to be transparent with you. Lord, you mean there could be a time when I have to go in and talk to somebody, maybe in the halls of government, maybe in, in somewhere along the way, that when I think about this person, it, it turns my stomach. When I, I think about the lifestyle, when I think about the, the things that go on that, that I read in the Bible, there, there are clear things that people do that God calls an abomination. The Hebrew word literally means it turns his stomach. It's an onomatopoeia. It's a word that sounds in the Hebrew like it's spelled. And it just, can I just say, it makes God sick? Like Jonah made that fish sick? Lord, there's certain people, we, you expect me to go and talk to that one? You know, we go knock on doors and we love it when somebody opens the door and lets us talk with them either on their front porch or, hey, come on in, let, let's get tea together, you know, let's get coffee, let's get a drink, let's, let's sit down, let, let's talk through the Scriptures. That used to happen more and more. Now it's few and far between. I don't know how many doors we have to knock on before somebody will even recognize that we're, we're, we're friendly people, you know, we're a church that, that loves our community and loves the neighborhood and we just want to talk about the things of God with them and for them to invite us in. It is few and far between, but oh, it's joy when that happens. It's real easy to talk to people that want to listen. It's a lot harder to talk to people that, well, they're just going a completely different direction. So take that for, for what it is. Jonah did what he was commanded to do, but he did it with complaining. He did it with complaining. He complained in God's faithfulness. Look at chapter 4, if you would. But it, pleased, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. God saved him, and he got angry. What? We rejoice when people get saved, don't we? <laughs> Praise the Lord. They want to live for Jesus. We saw two give their life uh, to the Lord today and identify with Him in baptism. It was a picture of His death, burial, and resurrection. They identified with His church. They want to serve Jesus because they've already been saved. Hallelujah, we rejoice with that. You know, it'd be like Jonah coming to our service this morning and leaving in a huff going, what do they mean they're doing? I can't, that's just foolish, isn't it? Well, if you understand how Nineveh had treated Jonah's people, you might be able to relate nationally. Where did the enemies come from that took the northern tribes captive? If we were to put it in context, let's uh, say that someone uh, had come to America, and this is just hypothetical, and taken over America and became our, our downright enemies, and we were s submitted to them and had to pay tribute to them, and, and then their capital city was going to be judged. How would you feel about that? God's finally dealing with our enemies. Wait, you want me to go tell them that you'll save them? Conflicting messages, 
Jonah has a lot of things to work through here as an Israelite and as a nation. I'm not saying it's right, but I'm saying humanly speaking, I can, I can kind of see where I could stand in his shoes and I'm not justifying it. It was wrong. But before we say, oh, Jonah, you're wrong, you're wrong. Remember, as the old preacher used to say, when you point one finger out, you got three pointed back. Easier said than done, I think. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry and he prayed unto the Lord. That's a good place to start. He knew where to go. And said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish. Now we know why he went the other way. See, it's answered right here in the book. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, I take, take, I beseech thee, my life from me. You see how far Jonah's going? He says, it's not worth it anymore. How can you get to this place? This is a foolish place to be, Jonah. It didn't do Job any good when he was there in that place, emotionally, spiritually. It didn't do him any good. It didn't do others in the Bible any good to get to this place. And yet, Jonah is just so torn up over this. He says, go ahead and just, just let me die. Take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. And see, my enemies prospered because they got right with you. Lord, help us. Lord, help us. When we look at someone who maybe doesn't live the way we think they should, or, or we look at somebody who's persecuting the church of God, and we're supposed to take a message of hope and life to them, God help us to speak it with love in our heart, not anger. Not like Jonah. See, Paul had to stand before somebody one day that was persecuting the church, and he boldly gave an account for Jesus Christ, and he spoke the truth with love. And he models for us how to be a witness before the halls of government, before kings, before the Gentiles, before the Jews. Every one of them, Paul, was a witness like no other. And I thank God that there's coming a day prophesied that there'll be 144,000 more like him to turn this old world upside down in the midst of judgment like Nineveh never even knew. It's coming. But God's got his witness. Oh, let's see, verse number 3. Therefore, take my life, verse number 4. Then said the Lord, dost thou well to be angry? Hey, Jonah, how you doing? Is that uh, working out pretty good for you there, being all angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd. Hey, He prepared a fish before for Jonah. Now He's going to prepare a gourd. And made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. Even in our misery, even in our, in our stubbornness, God says, here, let me take care of that. Let me help you with your sorrow, Jonah. But Jonah wouldn't have it. His mind is made up. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. Thank you for the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. Well, there goes my gourd. And it came to pass when the sun did rise that God prepared a vehement east wind, a fish, a gourd, a worm, a wind. Hmm. God prepares a lot of things, doesn't He? The sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and he wished himself to die and said, it is better for me to, to die than to live. God said to Jonah, did you hear me the first time, Jonah? Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. See how stubborn he is? Is, is this reaction not almost prophetic? in some ways, of Jesus' teaching regarding the prodigal's older brother, which in that parable, mind you, is a picture of Israel, right? Remember the son that came to himself and said, I'm not even fit to be called the son anymore. I'm going to return to my father. Maybe he can hire me like a servant, and I can at least have something to eat after he wasted his substance with riotous living. Well, everything's fine and well. The, the prodigal returns and there's rejoicing, but don't forget the gourd looming in the back. There was an older brother that was pretty huffy about all of that. And here's Jonah, a picture of Israel perhaps. Mm. Are we not 
according to the Apostle Paul in Romans 9 through 11, to be as Gentiles who are grafted in to the promises and the mercies of God by faith, are we not to be a provocation of Israel to jealousy as they remain in their broken off state? Would to God that Israel were grafted in again. It'll happen. It's coming. Even so, come Lord Jesus. One day they'll be passed under the rod. So do you, do you understand the, the great opportunity we have? Not only to witness to the Gentiles like Jonah did. He took the message to the Gentiles and to kings. But to witness to the Jewish people. Thank God for ministries like Brother Ron Draper that have a heart to reach the Jewish people, to provoke them to a godly jealousy so that they can see that God has saved us, He can do it for them too, and they can find faith in their Messiah, the Yeshua, HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they can believe on Him as they will be one day grafted in with us Gentiles together with God as both the church and Israel are represented in that new Jerusalem. The foundations and the gates. The apostles are there. The twelve tribes of Jacob are there. United and one in God. Oh, Jonah, what a picture. There'll be no sign given, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And so we say with John the Revelator, that new Jerusalem that John saw, it led him to say, even so, come Lord Jesus. We say, even so, come Lord Jesus. Jonah chapter 4, verse 10 and 11 one of the most uh, interesting endings to, a book, to, to any of the books of the Bible. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and all so much cattle? Jonah... Get over yourself. I don't know what it is that hinders you from witnessing like you should, but can I just plead with you here to see it like God sees it? We struggle sometimes with the language of verses like uh, heaping coals of fire on their head. That's been misconstrued to be taken as we're going to do good to them and then we're, it's going to, we're going to get them back. That's how we get vengeance. That's the wrong way to understand that. It's medicinal. When you understand what Solomon was saying in Proverbs and where it's repeated in the New Testament, it is being able to see someone in their condition with eyes like a nurse would attending to a sick patient. And maybe you've heard the stories or you've been one. I hope not where the nurse comes in and tries to administer the medication that's needed and kicking and screaming the whole way, don't give me the shot, no, I'm not taking it, don't give me this, I don't want it, and they're fighting the whole time. But the nurse knows and has been given permission. Okay, I understand the illustration only goes so far, but the nurse is trying to help. And I don't know how many nurses may have taken a black eye somewhere along the line from you know, a grumpy patient. But if that nurse said, phooey with them, I've had it, I'm going to sit under my gourd. You go ahead and just die in your disease that I'm trying to help you with. You do you? No, we, we wouldn't do that to a nurse, would we? And yet, sometimes we can get pretty grouchy sometimes. I think God's telling Jonah here, you need a bigger perspective. It's bigger than Israel. It's bigger than you, Jonah. It's bigger than Nineveh. Look at all these people. Look at all these people. Thousands. Hundreds of thousands of people right there. It says, how many people were there? How many people today, right outside these doors, need the message of the gospel that you can give to them? When they slam the door in your face, it's okay. We need to see their condition. We don't press it. We don't cast our pearls before swine. We go through the 90 and 9 to find the one that the Lord's looking for. He came to seek and save that which was lost. You might give out thousands of John and Romans before you even have somebody give you the time of day to talk to them about Jesus. But keep going. This is the medicine that the world needs. This is the remedy for our souls. This is the message of hope in God, in the Scriptures. 
There's an avalanche ahead. I close with this, uh, this story here. Dave Boone first saw the avalanche that swept his car over a guardrail on I-40 here in Colorado. It was just a puff of powder. After the brief warning, a snowy burst of wind knocked the car out of control. Quote, not even a second later, a freight train hit us, Boone said. Boone had been traveling with his wife, June, uh, Gary Martinez, who was 13. They were on their way to a youth group ski trip. The three of them had been discussing the possibility of an avalanche. Again, I quote, We were talking about avalanches and how there was so much snow and stuff, and we turned the corner and saw some white powder, and it, and it slammed us into the guardrail, Boone said. The wall of snow knocked the car over the rail and caused it to roll hundreds of feet down uh, the steep mountain slope. In the middle of the descent, the car struck a tree and was knocked out of the avalanche's grasp. It came to stop upside down and pointing back uphill. Fortunately, uh, Boone and his wife were well trained. After clearing an airway and freeing himself from the seatbelt, Boone was able to exit the car along with Martinez and then cut his wife free from her restraints. Despite several bumps, bruises, scrapes, none of the three required hospital hospitalization. For Boone, the experience was a reminder that warnings and hints of danger need to be respected. The signs read, Avalanche area, no stopping, he said. We've driven by that place hundreds of times. We've skied avalanche chutes. We, we've worn beepers and, and always carried an avalanche shovel. We've seen avalanches, but in our wildest dreams, we never imagined getting hit in a car by one. Warnings need to be heeded. Jude said it this way. He said, some save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There's certain scenarios where the fear of God needs to be put in somebody because they're on the brink. And the Holy Spirit gives discernment when that is. And we can't just go around and do that to anybody until we've won their confidence and built a rapport with them. But if we love them, we're going to let them know, hey, you're going down a path that's not good. And yet year after year, we might gather with them. We might sit across the table from them. We might be in this location with them and we come and they come and, well, we don't bring it up and we move on and we go on our way. We love them. There's no, there's no question about it. But when judgment comes... Jesus warned this world. He said it will come like a thief in the night. Warnings need to be heeded. Our commission is not to make sure every person heeds, only that every soul we come in contact with hears the opportunity of the forgiveness of their sins through faith in Jesus Christ. Can I say it one more time? God is merciful even to them who have failed to extend mercy to others, and He forgives those who humble themselves under His Word. We see that in Jonah. We see that in Nineveh. Whether you're a child of God who has been wayward, even a preacher that maybe has neglected God's will like old Jonah, or a lost sinner on your way to hell without God, God's mercy is freely available for you to find. As you hear His Word, receive His goodness. Let that goodness lead you to repentance. Change your mind toward Him and let godly sorrow change your destiny, if you'll get right with God, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness. And we've read the book of Jonah here tonight. And our soul is burdened. Lord, there's so many things that we need you for. I need you every day. And you've been that to me. Lord, I know sometimes these messages can, can seem like doom and gloom all the time, but really, Lord, you've given me such joy on a daily basis. And, and I don't worry about tomorrow. Lord, I, I know I'm safe in your hand, and I'm okay with you. My family's okay with you. As far as I know, Lord, we're, we're so blessed. And yet, 
there's a part of me that just wants to weep because I wish more people would heed your warnings. Oh God, give us a voice to speak your word with courage, with conviction, to stand and having done all, stand with the whole armor of God on us so that like Paul did, we can boldly speak as we ought to speak. But that's not going to come, Lord, without the prayers of your people. Help us to pray for one another, even down to where we go out on Saturdays having a prayer team to pray for those that are going out talking to folks, breaking the ice, getting to know people a little bit better, and then, Lord, helping them know how to trust you as Savior and follow you in baptism, and, and then, Lord, to be discipled in your word. That's our heart. That's our passion. And yet, we still have so much to do, Lord. Every week goes by, and I feel like I, I, I fall short somewhere. There's more I can do. God, help us, because this is where it starts. I, I can't change Washington, D.C., but I can, I can help you, Lord, change my neighbor if my neighbor will just trust you as Savior and want to follow you and understand your peace and joy. And Lord, I pray that as we gather here and assemble tonight, that you would give your people boldness and courage that they wouldn't leave it up to the person sitting next to them because they're going to have a sphere of influence that the person sitting next to them won't have. They're going to talk to people that I'm not going to be able to talk to. They're going to see people along the way that they need to share your word with. May they be bold in their faith, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And Lord, when you say go, may we do just that and watch as you bless our obedience as a church to be faithful to the great commission that you've given us. May we do it, though, with the right spirit, Lord, and not complain about anything along the way. May we see your goodness working in our community, and may it rejoice our souls. Thank you for your word. Have your way now, we pray in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want the piano to just play quietly. You've heard the word tonight. What is it that you need to do for the Lord? Let's all stand to our feet. The piano's playing. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. If you need to pray... You can come and pray here. You can pray at your seat. But let's do business with God. I know you're not Jonah. I know you, you don't have a Nineveh necessarily, but there's somebody that needs to hear the message of the Word. Will you be the one to take it to them this week, today, tomorrow, every day? Be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is tenderly calling today. Won't you heed that call and help others heed that call? God bless you.